Um, but going into India, I guess my reputation as a batsman was questioned around my ability to play spin. There was a lot of tension um, within the team, but there was also, I guess, a lot of internal tension because it was in conditions uh, against the team that I wasn't expected to perform. Did you earn a wee bit more respect from the changing room after that? I'd like to say yes, but I, I think the reality was probably not. I, and I look back on, on my career and I guess there's still a lot of unfinished business within within myself and I, I probably look back with a lot of regret because there were, I mean, as a young 20 year old, you, you don't mentally know how to cope with a lot of those situations, let alone performing at international level. So by no means did I, did I find the secret. Do you have a desire to return back to Zimbabwe and, and coach, coach the national team? All right, our first guest on the podcast is a former Zimbabwe international cricketer and a current head coach of the Otago Volts, Dion Ibrahim. Dion represented Zimbabwe at international level from 2001 until 2005, competing in 29 test matches and 82 one-day internationals along the way. During his time in New Zealand, he's applied his knowledge and expertise across several New Zealand domestic teams, including the Central Stags, Canterbury Kings before taking the reins as head coach of the Otago Volts in 2021. Dion is a great family man, spends his lunch break working here, working out here at World Fitness and is still trying to find the magic touch around the golf course. Ooh. Dion, it's a pleasure to have you on the show today. Hey, thanks for having <laughs> me guys. Have you got the secret for that touch, please let me know. Hey, uh, Dion, um, obviously you're from Zimbabwe, so early life in Zimbabwe, what was it like and, and how did you get into the game of cricket? Yeah, what was it like in uh, Zimbabwe? Look, Zimbabwe is an amazing country. Um, I guess I, I could liken it to the various extremes of awesome, uh, more spectacular, and that's both the positive and the, the negative. Um, yeah, it, uh, growing up there was, yeah, I guess he enjoyed, well, we enjoyed all the freedoms within various constraints. And the constraints were, were various, whether that be economical, whether it be some divide through race or, or religion or anything like that so it was it was really a, a melting pot of different kinds of experiences but uh, wonderful um, in terms of shaping a person uh, getting into cricket um, I suppose like most young boys and girls you know playing in the backyard with siblings so I've got an older brother um, and a dad who, who played the game so I was always the one that initially had to pick up the balls and be the fielder that did all the the dirty jobs of climbing the fence and getting the balls that were hit over. So, learnt that love for the game or got introduced to the game, I guess in that non-traditional manner or traditional manner if you want to look at it in that way. And when you got into sort of high school, was it, did you start getting into more representative cricket at that point and then was there a coach along mm -hmm. the way that said, you know, look Dion, I think you may have something that could get you to that next level? Yeah, the, what we had, which was really um, well set up um, in Zimbabwe, is that you play a lot of your sport in schools. So we had passionate teachers and, you know, with those teachers, they were, they were the coaches as well. So we had a really good foundation um, in terms of a pathway per se. Um, and whilst we played a lot of our cricket and, and into school cricket, there was always a representative age group bracket that you always would likely fall into. So from the ages of... 12, 13, there was uh, an age group that well, I guess people aspire to, to play in. So there was an under 13, an under 15, an under 17, and an under 19. And that was both provincial um, and then representative of the country. Mm -hmm. Okay. But was there a point in time where you were playing the game and sort of realised that the skill level that you had was probably a little bit above everybody else? Or did you have to be told that? Yeah. <laughs> Uh, I suppose I was always fortunate that I excelled in, in, in sport and, and sport in general because um, love, just love sport, you know, whether it be kicking a football, playing rugby, um, tennis, whatever the sport is, you know, I really enjoyed that. So uh, I, I guess I, I could sense that I was talented. Yeah, that always sounds terrible when you say it yourself, but um, I, I guess having played representative sport, having been a uh, a high performer in the teams that we played kind of figured yep you know I enjoy sport I, I excel at it I'm, I'm, in, I'm doing well at it so it's something I'd love to pursue yeah why that one though why cricket well it, funny you say that it actually uh, at the age of 18 I had to make a decision between rugby and cricket 
Um, so I got offered a, a scholarship to the University of Natal uh, for rugby at uh, under 19 or under 18 level. Um, but at five foot, I'd say five foot eight and a half maybe, <laughs> um, and at 80 kilos at, at best, um, playing first five eight, I, I kind of figured against a lot of the South Africans and international players, I probably rugby wasn't going to be my calling. Um, so I decided to take up cricket because um, at the same time we had a national academy and still had very good prospects internationally um, in terms of a career. So decided with my physique <laughs> that cricket was probably the, the, the likely choice. Okay. Yeah, because that was that, that, that Zimbabwe sort of system in, in the 90s and early 2000s and, and what you were sort of brought into as well was Zimbabwe were a pretty fire team at that point. They had, um, you know, Heath Streak, obviously the late great Heath Streak, um, the, the the Flower Brothers as well, and and touring, you know, New Zealand, beating New Zealand, uh, taking on um, Australia and 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 in, in England. And I'd just like to know, like, what it was like entering a a team like that that was you know, probably at the top of its game. Yeah, I mean, that was probably the most successful era. Um, the late 90s, early 2000s, we, we were reaping the rewards of a, a really well-established <coughs> system. Um, so all the players that were coming through were well-grounded, they had experiences, and when they were selected into the national team, um, were able to perform, um, albeit to sometimes a lesser extent of, of the big, big power nations. Um, and funny enough, we always used to compare ourselves, and in conversations, used to compare ourselves to New Zealand. Um, at, during that era because we identified that we had similar playing numbers um, in terms of the amount of people playing cricket, um, both at club level or at representative level. Um, we also identified that some of the constraints or challenges that we faced were very much shared within New Zealand. Um, and also the lifestyles were very similar in terms of how players came into the game and uh, found success through the game. So we always sort of married ourselves up against, well, you know, if, if the Kiwis are doing this or the Kiwis are capable of this, then we should be excelling here and excelling there. So mm -hmm. it was really a good measuring stick um, at that phase. Mm -hmm. So how did it feel once you got to, you know, the year 2001, how did it feel to then, you know, represent, you know, Zimbabwe, especially at a time, as, as you said, that, you know, the team was thriving and it had a lot of great, great players in it? Yeah, quite mixed emotions, uh, and and I say that because it was a childhood dream. I remember writing on a piece of paper at the age of fifteen that you know some of the goals I wanted to achieve, um, and to get it, I think it was eight months prior to the time I'd identified that I wanted to break into the national team, um, was just yeah, like I said, childhood dreams. However, at the time, the country and the team were starting to go through. I guess some challenges uh, politically, and with that came some racial challenges as well. So, um, whilst whilst receiving, I guess the the, uh, the acknowledgement of making your debut, there was also a lot of stress that came with it in terms of inter-team divide and um, interpersonal divide. Can we go back a step? Like this is what's really interesting to me is a lot of us write down goals when we're 15, 16, and we have aspirations but not many of us kick on, if that makes sense, to kind of reach the highest level. So what's the process in between? Or was, was there a little bit of luck attached to, to that? I, I guess there's always a bit of fortune that, that comes attached to it. And, and I, think, I think there's different kinds of people when it comes to, to goals. You know, I think there's those that are really process driven and then really clear on, well, if I stick to this process, I'll achieve X, Y, and Z. Is that you? No, no, and, and the only reason is, uh, I guess I I find the processes or I find the flexibility within the processes, knowing where the outcome is, and, and that's that's just me. And I, I suppose there's a few people out there that that are, are very similar. But I, I like to set, whether they be lofty or ambitious goals, um, down the track, and then they might be several years down the track, or you know, um, in the distant future, um, and know that. Well, in order to get there, I need to break it down into A, B, C, D, and E. Um, and through that, then find the processes that will really connect me to that. Um, knowing that at any given time, there's going to be a hijacking or a, uh, an accident along the way. So uh, I guess knowing where, where I want to end up or what the end goal is um, guides and governs that process. Yeah, cool. How do you deal with that, that, 
that pressure then when, as you said before, around, you know, getting selected and there was a lot of, you know, inter-team divide and things like that. And then having to then perform in front of, you know, you, your home fans or you're touring or you're taking on a team like Australia and New Zealand. Like, how do you, how do you mentally deal with that and having all those sort of pressures on, you know, a young person's shoulder? Because at the time you probably would have been in your, in your, in your early 20s. Um, and having to having to deal with that, like what were what were you like mentally then? Well, I, I didn't find the secret. That, that, that's for sure. And I look back on on my career, and I guess there's still a lot of unfinished business within within myself. And I, I probably look back with a lot of regret because there were, I mean, as a young twenty year old, you you don't mentally know how to cope with a lot of those situations, let alone performing at international level. So. By no means did I did I find the secret, um, but I, I think through that it's actually helped me through my coaching to actually mm. identify the challenges that young players are, are faced with. You know, it's not just the, the nature of trying to hit a ball or catch a ball or bowl a ball. You know, there's a lot more other aspects in their life that they'll, they'll find challenging. And I guess as a coach or hopefully as a mentor or as a friend, you can try and assist and, and help and guide them. But yeah, looking back at yeah. Definitely struggled. It, it wasn't something we were supported with. Um, I, I know currently within New Zealand and within, I guess, sporting landscapes, there's this whole concept of belonging, you know, and the, and the whole, um, yeah, the concept of belonging, which had we had something like that in, in our national team at that stage, I think would have reaped the rewards uh, far greater than what we, we ended up, you know. And But it came with a lot of challenges. I mean, the Zimbabwean landscape is, is very, very different to, to anywhere else in the world. Mm. So here's the interesting thing with cricket. So you and I have sort of talked about this, is that it's a team sport, but inside of that team sport is a lot of individuality. When you go out and bat, you are batting for yourself, essentially. You know, you make one mistake, you're letting yourself down as well as the team, whereas a game like rugby, like we're playing so many misses a tackle, we can kind of get, kind of get hidden in the rest mm. of the team uh, the team activities, if, if, if uh, yeah, if we use that sort of analogy. So, how do you switch, or what did you have any process from sitting waiting to bat to then going out to bat? Did you have a switch where you went into concentration mode and like because I've scored three centuries, just throw that one out there. <laughs> well done, <laughs> mate. That's, yeah, that was that was like two and a half hours of concentrating, which is a yeah. lot of time for me to stay in the moment. Yeah. So yeah, how? Yeah, I, I'm really interested in how you stay in that moment for that long when it comes to, especially at international level, where you're playing against the best. Yeah, and, and, and you've hit the nail on the head there. It's, it's trying to stay in the moment or connecting yourself to the moment because the mind runs wild naturally, you know, and, and I think a lot of the, the best players will identify the fact that they struggle in that area as well. You know, the, the ability to stay connected to what's in front of you, what's happening right there and then without getting too cluttered or distracted is, is the skill and the art. Um, and there's various techniques that you know, people employ and um, the biggest ones are the routines and, and really, being, really being attached and clear on your routine and whether that be a mental routine in terms of a thought process or internal dialogue or physical processes that you can connect to that forms a distraction but also forms a, an ability to get yourself set up to be in that moment. Yeah. Um, I, I heard a really great analogy um, from one of our players actually a, a while ago talking about, you know, often when you're out there, it's like a sushi train, you know, that there's a train of sushi that comes and, you know, those little plates of sushi are countless different thoughts and at any given time you'll have a number coming through and in and out, it's acknowledging them and, but then realising, well, how do I attach to that one thought that needs to be the, the current and most important one at the time. So did you have a process? I did, I did. It, um, it, it changed um, from early on to, I guess, the back end of, of my playing days. And as I became a little bit more um, experienced or understood myself and understood my mind, you know, as a 20 year old, <laughs> you're still figuring out a lot of things. So um, the process was quite elaborate initially. You know, there was a lot of physical cues, touches, movements, um, that, What's yeah, fidgets, no? yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. you know, and a lot of those become just unconscious habits. Um, but then there were real deliberate ones that, you know, would set yourself up, would that be in your setup to actually give you the best possible, best possible start in terms of your technique? 
Um, and then there was various um, internal cues or internal dialogue that would um, connect me to the moment. Yeah, cool. And so, sort of, because this is interesting, golf's the same. Yeah. So you have that one very, that's a very short, it's like split second moment where you have to make a decision and therefore you go through it with a process. Mm. It's the same when a bowler's coming towards you and you have to make a decision based on what comes out of the hand. So yeah, what, was, what, was go, what goes through the mind before the bowls, the bowls delivered? Well, the, as little the, as possible. Yeah, the trick is as little as possible. And I know there's that whole concept of trying to quiet and quiet the mind. You know, I had a real, I'll say an epiphany almost, a golden moment with my three-year-old um, a couple of months ago. And this was, I thought, coaching 101. I, I guess you always see your child and you, you see them climbing up a, a set of jungle gym or, or anything like that. And as soon as you pepper them with instructions as a parent, it clutters them and you can just see what they're doing break down. But as soon as you give them that space to just have that innocent abandon. It's amazing what they can actually accomplish and do when they, the unconscious mind takes over. But as soon as we add clutter to the conscious mind, we see things break down or things slow up or yeah, errors being made. So I guess it's, it's trying to find that trick and everyone's slightly different. You know, everyone you know, will, 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 will find some elements easy, some elements difficult. So I guess the biggest trick is, well, how can you quieten the mind? Um, and, and I think I was listening to a podcast the other day around Steve Hansen talking about something similar. And he talked about when you drive in a car, you actually don't think about what you're doing. You know, you, the autopilot takes off and because you, you've done it so often enough, it, it just becomes habit. But as soon as you almost have an accident or something pulls out in front of you, all of a sudden your yeah, conscious mind takes, yeah. And things all of a sudden become a little bit stiffer, a little bit rigid. Um, yeah, so I, I liken that analogy. Yeah, I think a lot of people um, don't realise with cricket, and, and especially in test match as well, is that you could be an opening batsman, um, you could be like a Kane Williamson who comes in at bats at three, and it's 11am on the first day, and you know he goes off and went, you know, gets a century, but you've got to think about that he's out there in 30 degree heat, and he's facing a, a bowler like Mitchell Stark who's bowling in at 150, um, and taking on spin bowlers and, you know, got a, got a crowd watching it as well. Like, I, that must be a big toll that you face with players, especially in the four-day game because, um, you know, Otago will play four-day matches against, you know, teams here domestically. Um, but that must be some, a, a conversation that, that you and your, and your team must have with a lot of players that are batting, you know, maybe one to four that... Um, you have to be mentally in it for a long period of time. And I don't think a lot of people understand that. What is that like for those players? In terms of the duration? Mm. Yeah, it, it, it can be quite taxing. And, and players are actually, they're really good at how they distract themselves when their moment isn't needed. You know, so a batsman batting at number four, they'll know how to switch off and relax and watch in the distance, but not actually be attached to every ball mm. um, in terms of that, keeping that, their mind pretty fresh. Um, yeah, so they're, they're, and every player's got something different, you know, they might go and read a book, some might be encouraged to have a snooze. Um, but over the course of a day, um, they'll know how to switch on and switch off uh, closer to the time. And obviously, as an incoming batsman, you never know when your time will be when it, the next wicket falls and you need to walk out. So the ability to have that heightened sense of switching on, um, every player has. And, Every player will have their slightly different routine or switch on or cues that they'll go through. Um, is it, could that be a learned behaviour or is that something that like just innately you're born with, do you think? Uh, it's, it's a learned behaviour, I, I think, because as you come through, learned and, and innate, I think, um, the learned behaviour will become a little bit more sharp and more specific as you, I guess, get older or move through the grades, um, in particular of how to manage yourself because the demands become a little bit greater, obviously, sure. um, the higher you go up. And obviously in professional cricket, the, those demands are, are, are the highest. So they, they definitely become a little bit more learned and a little bit more gleaned and, and a little bit more polished. Um, and I imagine if you ask any of the top players or any player what they do in terms of routines or the ability to switch on at the end of their career would have been vastly different 
um, throughout their career, you know, especially when they first started. So um, they'll learn exactly what, what gets them going and, and at some stages we'll even start trying um, new techniques. You know, I think that's the beauty about cricket is that there's a superstition in everyone <laughs> that if something works for once you know, and you get runs or you take wickets, you often tend to try that again and again. Was there, a, was there a routine that you did when you were playing international cricket that that you used and looking back at it now, would you still use it or? <laughs> <laughs> there was a routine and, and it probably fell in the, the, the form of routine and superstition, you know, and whether it was making sure I did the same pad up every time mm. I put the same shoe on, same socks, or the same socks, same underwear, um, same vest. Um, mm. Every time um, there would be a way that I'd uh, put my gloves on, the way that I'd spin the bat. Um, when I, when the wicket fell and it was time to walk down or walk through the steps or walk across the line, there was a, a couple of routine around leg kicks or butt kicks, and you know then a couple of stretches, and a lot of that was just to to diffuse the nervous tension. Um, so it was a mixture of one getting the cues to switch the mind on, but then also you know that you've got the butterflies and the nervous tension as well. I need to burn some of that up or find a bit of synergy be with myself before I get out into the middle. Um, so yeah, there, there was, I'd imagine I would do the exact same thing. And if I was to play a game tomorrow and I haven't played a game in over 10, 12 years, I'd imagine unconsciously I'd still <laughs> say the same routine, <laughs> just out of habit. And uh, I guess, you know, that's where probably the innate or, or the learned behaviors becomes quite set. Mm. Is there a, um, looking back on your international career, is there, is there a moment that sticks with you that you will always remember or, or a moment that you're always proud of? Yeah, a number, a number of them. Um, obviously, debuting um, was one of them. Um, there was the, the test match we beat India in, in Zimbabwe and they had never won a test series against us and they they had just come off, and you guys are of that age and that uh, vintage, so you'll remember that test series that the Indians played Australia and the Indians had to follow on and, and ended up winning. It was a, I think they came to Zimbabwe as test champions or you know, world number yeah, one at the yeah. time. And so th they won the first test and um, going to the second test, they'd, you know, the, this was going to be their first series win in, in Zimbabwe. And, and we ended up winning that test match um, with, well, I guess, our problem was making decent contributions in both <laughs> innings. Um, but but I, I think the, the biggest, well, probably the best moment um, was probably the test match in India. Uh, the following year, the, I think it was 2003, it was the second test um, and I hadn't played in the first test. Um, but going into India, I guess my reputation as a batsman was questioned around my ability to play spin. Um, and this was now getting towards some of the heights of some of the big divides within the, the squad. So there was a lot of tension um, within the team, but there was also, I guess, a lot of internal tension because it was in conditions uh, against the team that I wasn't expected to perform. Um, and by being selected into the second test match, um, it was a surprise well, one to myself, but to a number of the teammates. And I'll never forget, we were sitting in the change room the day before the test match and the team was announced. And um, as my name was announced, there was a, a couple of, oh, fuck. <laughs> <laughs> really? I'm looking around, I'm thinking, oh, gee, you know, this is one of the toughest conditions you're going to walk out in tomorrow. And you some confidence. <laughs> yeah, three quarters of you guys on, on back in you. And, and I remember getting, there was two guys, and, and he's, he's one of the leading commentators now, Pommy Mbangwa. Um, he was in the far side of the, the changer, and he gave it a, well done, D, you know, congratulations, mate. You know, all the best, you do we bloody well. I was like, shit. Thanks, at least someone backs me <laughs> going in. And, and it was just, uh, I suppose there was a, a, all odds against all odds against me. Um, and then, funny enough, that night I had a, had a call from my partner at the time and there was a, a bit of a family grievance back home, so we were on the phone till late o'clock. Um, so I hadn't had much sleep. Um, preparation leading in was um, yeah, not feeling supported. Mm. Um, and they're walking out into uh, a test match against India in their home conditions. Um, spinning track. Spinning track mm -hmm. um, in Delhi. Um, and, and, you know, at that time they had Habajan Singh and Anil Kumble. So, yeah, it was fairly challenging. But ended up getting 95, and, and to this day, I still maintain if we had um, DRS in those days, uh, it could have looked different. <laughs> but 
it, you know, shared a, a record partnership with Andy Flower. Um, I think it was 160 odd uh, partnership um, for the fourth wicket or third wicket, um, and another record partnership with um, Grand Flower a at the time. And you know, walking off with 95 in those conditions, mm. you know, they, they just gave a sense of real pride and you know, the sense of well. You know, when nothing else was going your way and then mm. things were very much against you. Mm. Um, it was probably one of the biggest moments that you look back and, and really proud of. Did you earn a wee bit more respect from the changing room after that or was it still quite divided? Did you get a few more like, oh, great stuff, D, or was it more of a, you know, just a thumbs up and we move on sort of situation? Um, I'd like to say yes, but I, I think the reality was probably not. Mm. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah, that, 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 I guess that would have been tough for you. I mean, as you said, being in those conditions, India, um, a lot of teams don't win in India, and let alone people, you know, almost hitting a century as well um, in those conditions against those players, because those spin bowlers are probably India, one of two of India's best, best. Spin, yeah, uh, world's mm. best. And so, yeah, I feel like that would have been really tough for you to obviously carry on even though you know your, your team probably didn't really support you the, the full way yeah it, it, it was one of that one of those moments we it, it was what it was you know and you, you kind of understood it we, we knew what we what we were operating with and, and and i suppose right back to the first question around growing up in zimbabwe you you find that freedom within the constraints that you have or you find that comfort within the uncomfortable situations mm -hmm. that you have and it just it's a way of life, you know, and then you, you know, you know what you're working with. Mm. It kind of goes back to that point that you made around, like, within New Zealand and the whole ethos now being around belonging. I think is, in a again, cricket's just a very, very different sport in that it is a team sport, full of individuals, really. So you know, you have, yeah, you know it. You know it when you feel like you're part of a team. Yeah, because other people make you feel like you're part of the team, but you also know it and feel it when it's not. Hundred percent, and, and cricket's one of the toughest sports, I think, to really create that true connection yeah. um, in terms of a team environment and, and really have that that culture that that you feel truly connected to each other. Um, I think rugby, football, um, all, all the pattern of the sport, you know, that, that works on patterns. I think it's quite easy because you often rely on the synergy and the linking of three, four other players, whereas cricket is very much an internal battle majority of the time. And, you know, your your success greatly depends on your ability um, and your execution. So it it, it breeds selfishness, um, you know, naturally or unnaturally. Um, so a dressing room or a, a team culture that truly has a, a sense of belonging and connection is gold dust. And, and that's something I guess we, we, we I say we pride ourselves um, with the vaults is that it's a genuine connection that we, we, we try to establish and I guess you get the right people in the right dressing room and it becomes a lot easier. Mm. How did you, once, once your international career was, was done and your, your playing career was done, you know, was it a natural uh, move into coaching or did you find it difficult at the beginning? You know, how, how did that process sort of look or work out for you? It, it became quite natural and, and more so, I think I was quite a very selfish cricketer as a player. I, I'll put my hand up, I'll be the first to admit that. Um, but what I noticed towards the back end of my playing days is that the, the effort into myself was no longer there in terms of I'd rather prioritise that energy and effort into seeing someone else perform. And, and I suppose I was lucky at the time up in New Plymouth in Taranaki that um, was involved with various age groups or schools and, and had a lot of young players coming through and just had a, a real passion to see them succeed. You know, and, and I think that probably stimulated and, and kick-started the fire within the, the belly to actually see other players um, thrive and, and succeed. And I suppose having a, I won't say a life of experiences, but uh, a fair bit of experience of, of both the good and the bad, it, mm. it, it made it quite easy to identify, well, what would help players um, actually benefit and, and thrive in that. So it was fairly natural, um, but I suppose circumstances and situations allowed it to be natural. Was Is there a sort of a common theme that you've sort of seen with um, New Zealand players over your time, you know, as we've said earlier, that you've 
you've coached and been assistant coach of, of three New Zealand domestic sides, men domestic sides. Is there, is there an, a common theme that you've sort of seen with cricketers as they've gone through age group into those professional teams? Yes, it, and I suppose it, it varies because you, you talk about cricket in general where then you talk about representative um, and two very different mindsets. You know, I think those that play the game for the enjoyment and the love and to be with mates is very different to those that have that burning passion and desire and ambition in them. So you, you definitely can see the different character and different behavioural traits in, in each. Um, and I guess looking at the ones that go through that pathway with that desire to make representative teams or want to become black caps. And I, I think the one thing you, you genuinely see is a burning desire within them, you know, and, and with that, you, you find that they be really good problem solvers um, at the time. You know, they, they have these lofty ambitions and are willing to challenge themselves or be challenged. Um, so those are the ones that you, you can often see them separate from the pack quite, quite early. Mm -hmm. Um, and it's often you see it in the most menial of tasks or, or games, you know, those ones that will have a lower risk um, threshold than, than others, you know, those that, well, I won't quite try this just in case I look mm. a like a fool or well, I don't want to fail versus those that, look, I'll try this because if I fail, it's not the end of the world and I'm only going to learn something in the process. Um, so you definitely see that there's, there's definitely a, uh, trends but also differences to the different um, makeup of, of players. What about between the countries? So like the difference between Zimbabwe and New Zealand? Are there similarities? Are there differences? Yep. Yeah, a, a, lot of, a lot of similarities. Um, I, yeah. I guess traditionally cricket is played within, I guess, your affluent areas and affluent schools. So you come through your traditional pathway. So very similar. Um, I suppose people are, are, are people, you know, so I guess the trends are, are very much the same. I guess you always have a bias <laughs> from where you come from and you see things slightly a little bit different. So I've always made sure that, you know, that isn't a, an unconscious bias that, well, we used to do it this way, so, you know, this needs to be, it. it's, it's very simple, very different in the sense that, you know, New Zealanders grew up in New Zealand with everything that they have around them and Zimbabweans the same. But I think the, the internal behaviours or the behavioural traits are very much the same. You know, that you'll see that whether you, in New Zealand, Zimbabwe, Australia, India, the, the players or the people that um, genuinely have that desire to be better um, or desire to have higher ambition or, you know, will, will accomplish a little bit more. Do you have a desire to return back to Zimbabwe and, and coach, coach the national team? Yeah, it's, it's an interesting question because if you had to ask me that uh, probably three, four years ago, I would have probably said no, um, just because of issues, things that have happened in the past. Um, but as you get older and you mature, but it, it's definitely something um, I've thought of and it, it's still a passion. I, I guess you still have that internal bar, bond with um, mm. your home country. And I guess watching the struggles over the last wee while and, and in a few years, it's, it's something that there's definitely moments where I think I'm, I'm giving my best to the benefits of New Zealand and New Zealand cricket and, and whilst I own New Zealand cricket and, and the domestic cricket, you know, pretty much my career, um, there's a part of me that sometimes looks back and thinks, well, that would really be cool to contribute to success there. But in saying that, I still feel that there's a lot of unfinished business here and I, I guess my, my passion and um, attachment at the moment is very very much here within the domestic game and, and within New Zealand cricket because over the last well, close to 10 years now that have helped work within the pathways and, and contribute to the players that are coming through the, the New Zealand circuit. So I guess there's that a real bond and attachment to seeing the success of the Black Caps and uh, as well as domestic cricket. As so it's, it's a bit of a, yes, but I, I guess, yeah, you never say never, but it's one of those that you, your passion, your passion to to help is definitely there. Is, is the goal, you know, the, the goal in, in the next, you know, five years or so to, to be in that Black Caps coaching setup, to be, 
to be the next Mike Hesson or Gary Stead or, 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 or co, is, 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 that the, is that the goal or is it something else? Yeah, look, look the, the goal is, and we mentioned about writing goals down or having goals, and it's definitely um, something that I've written down in, in terms of my long-term goal or, or mid, middle, mid-term goal is to contribute to the Black Caps' success you know, in whatever capacity that might be, whether that be as a specialist coach or... Um, yeah, because you've had the, you've had the taste of, of of that before last year when you went over. It was to, it was to England, it correct? Was, yeah. yeah, yeah. What was that like being in that sort of setup? Obviously, a different international team, but also now you're in the coaching side of it. What what was that sort of like? Pretty surreal because uh, I guess my coaching journey hasn't been as traditional as, as others, um, and, and surreal because going to England on a test tour is is probably one of the, the highlights of anybody's career, uh, whether you're a player or a coach, there's just something different about a test tour um, in places like England, India, and Australia. And to be on the other side of, I guess, the fence as a coach at international level was something that was completely unique. You know, I'd been an international player, played in England. Um, so to be able to be there as a coach with the Black Caps was again, a real sense of achievement and accomplishment, but an acknowledgement of, well, you have the, all these opportunities, you know, and it's now, well, what do you do with them? Mm-hmm. Um, so I, I thoroughly enjoyed it, and it was great to see that there's no special source or secrets that contribute to success. You know, you, you get the right balance of motivated people and obviously talented and skilled, and you have the recipe for success. It's, it's how, you manage, how you manage them all. Yeah, that's probably the success, I, I guess, of coaches these days or at that level. The skill level is there. Mm. The ability is there. It's making sure that it peaks at the right time. So as far as secret sources concerned, when it comes to coaching, what do you think you contribute to the team if we, if we go back to Otago or in the Black Caps when you were involved with that, um, with that coaching stuff? What could you see from the coaches there or what do you think you contribute that kind of allows that secret source to come out with the players so that they peak at the right time? Oh, that's, a, that's a very good it's, question. Yeah, it's, <laughs> it's probably an individual thing because yeah. they're all different. Yeah, and, and I think with any coaching environment or staff, it, it's if, if you have the right people in, in the, the staff, and the Black Caps definitely do, I mean, the, the success is undoubted over the last few years. But I think it's, it's picking up the little pieces that, often the head coach or the bowling coach or the batting coach or the manager don't quite see, you know, and I think have been able to be that extra pair of eyes or ears and, you know, back here in Otago knowing that, you know, Ben, our assistant coach or Megan, our SNC or Scott, our um, physio, they see things that you don't see. Um, and the strength of the environment or the strength of the management of, of those players or being able to find those little secret pieces or sources now and again is the identification of just when something's about to fall or break or, or something's not quite there and, and you know, the, the head coach might miss or the bowling coach might miss or so on and so forth. So it, it's... Team team effort. 100% team yeah. effort. Yeah. Um, and, and that's where I think, I think the, I keep saying, you, know, you get the right people in the room and, and everything becomes a lot easier. You know, success becomes easier because everyone can throw a ball, everyone can hit a ball, everyone can catch a ball. But it's the nuances around, well, what does player A need now to player B tomorrow? You know, and, and that's that's where the team within the team really comes to the fore. Last season was a was was, was a pretty good season for the Otago Bolts, um, making a couple of um, semi-finals uh, along the way. A lot of successes, but there was also some tough times as well. When the going gets tough, what do you say to your team to, to get the best out of them? Let's say it's a, you know, you, um, you're on a four day match and it's it's not looking too good, and you're on day three and you know it's the morning of day four. What do you say to that team to then get the result, to get them motivated to go out there and and and, and chase you know that that two fifty three hundred runs in a day? Yeah, look, I'd be lying if I got the message right every time. Um, I think the biggest thing is ensuring that there's a consistency um, to whatever the messaging is. I think cricket in general, whether you're playing four-day cricket, one-day cricket or 2020, you, you ride the highs and lows 
you know, over the course of a day sometimes, you know, and over a four-day game, you might be ahead and you might be behind in two consecutive days. So being able to provide uh, some consistency of, of messaging, you know, and then with that, mm-hmm. I- ensuring that you always identified, I use the acronym WIN, you know, what's important now. Um, and, and a lot of the time, you know, four-day cricket's a great example because the game isn't won in day one, day two, day three, it's one in day four, but the most important thing is what's necessary now to allow day two to be what it needs to be day three and, and so forth. So connecting to those moments and connecting to the, the smaller wins um, as we go through the days is really important, um, knowing that as soon as a player or a team looks too far ahead, you know, you've, you might miss and might um, fail in, in that moment in a particular time. I, I think 2020 is probably the hardest format to, to keep those messages because so quick, eh? it's so quick, so fickle, and, and that's where the consistency um, of messaging needs to occur because you can play well and in the space of two or three balls, that game could be taken away. And mm. As players, you know, the players involved in that moment will often feel that the world's just fallen on their heads. So the ability to be able to keep a consistent, calm message, but also ensure that they're really clear of what's important now, and often that's the processes, you know, and the process that often they do so well, uh, but the results may may differ. So it's ensuring that there's that sense of, I keep saying consistency, and, and that's what's important now. Quickly want to touch on, because you do train here at World Fitness, love to know what your sort of training routine is, because we've walked in here and I was talking to one of our other trainers, um, Ginge, uh, before, and he said, oh, yeah, I see him, you know, running around and doing supersets of this and supersets of that. So I'd, I'd like to know what, you know, being a, a, an ex-professional player, is anything that you that you did training-wise incorporate into now, or what are your sort of goals when you're, when you're training? Yeah, I, I guess I've... I want to have done a full circle of, of training um, routines. Uh, obviously, as a player or as a youngster, um, you're quite specific on what you're doing, and that's normally preparing your body or strengthening your body for performance and, and sport. Um, I've gone through that CrossFit phase. I've gone through uh, boxing, kickboxing phases. I, you know, I've done marathons. Um, at the moment, at 43, um, I'm now just trying to future-proof my body. <laughs> <laughs> so, and I guess because of the, the, the role that I have within the, the Otago Vols um, team, but also as, I suppose, modern-day coaches now, you have to be fairly active. Um, I mean, I, between Ben, my assistant coach, and, and I, would throw in excess of 2,000 balls a week, you know, and that's, that's a lot of pressure on the shoulders, backs, joints, you know, and, and you definitely feel it in the mornings when you wake up. So a lot of it's one, making yourself um, more purpose fit uh, for, for the job, but also, you know, at 43 with the young daughter, I'm looking ahead in 10, 15 years time to ensure that you know, I can still walk, run, climb and, and, and play with um, you know both her and, and potential grandchildren in the future. That's what I think a lot of people don't realise as well is that you're not a Ian Foster with um, a suit and tie <laughs> walking around making sure you know the players are right. You're actually in the training kit, you're throwing balls all the time. Um, I, I just think some people just don't realise that you're that involved in the team. Yeah, it, it's, uh, I, I, it, uh, you probably hit the nail on the head there. It's, it's a very different Cricket coaching, um, modern day cricket coaching, especially in domestic cricket, is very different to anywhere else in the world um, and any other sport because it is very much an active role. Um, and because it's not as heavily resourced as other sports and the nature of the role as coach, your, a lot of your credibility not only comes from your knowledge or experience and, and your management of the team, but then it's actually, are you able to throw balls? You know, Are you mm. able to catch balls? Are you able to hit balls? Um, you know, if you're running a fielding session, you've got to be very much part of that session in order to to drive it. But also, I guess the credibility of what you're trying to coach it needs to be demonstrated a lot of the time. So, um, unlike potentially um, international teams or, or heavily resourced um, domestic teams overseas, where the head coach is that manager type, and then you have your specialist coaches who then perform those roles at the moment domestic coaches yeah are, mm. we, we carry a number of hats <laughs> <Don't> <laughs> definitely everything. but it, I think that's the fun part as well you know it's it's to actually get on the tools and get you know in with the players you know and you work in with the player 
in the moment is yeah, is mm. gold dust, you know, and that's often when the, the connections really really formed. Mm. Well, quickly before we um, we finish up, we um, like to throw a bit of a quick fire, uh, forty five seconds. Uh, have you got a stopwatch there? I don't. Okay, I'll get I'll get, I'll get, I'll get, I'll get, I'll get my mobile phone out. <laughs> Um, and where is the stopwatch? Uh, there it is. There. It's a bit of a quiz. All yeah, right. it's a quiz. It's it's, it's very much uh, this or that sort of okay. sort of situation. So um, we've got we've got a lot of questions here. So hopefully you can you can get through them. You're going to be setting the times so every time. We've got a we've got someone um, oh, okay. in in the hot seat. They're going to give it a go. And so let's see uh, okay. how how quick you can sort of get Do through we it. We Kale's score. Oh yeah, Kale, uh, Kale, who we did a dummy run with. He what did what did he get? Twenty six. Twenty six. Twenty six. Forty five. Yeah, okay. but obviously it relies on me as well, trying to get the oh, yeah. <laughs> trying to read the questions correctly. Get the words <laughs> out. <laughs> um, oh, we lost it. We lost it. Yeah. Okay. All right. Are we ready? In three, two, one. Morning or night? Morning. Coffee or tea? Coffee. Introvert or extrovert? Introverted extrovert. Beach or mountains? Beach. Uh, early riser or night owl? Night owl. Yoga or gym? Gym. Fiction or non-fiction? Non-fiction. Podcasts or books? Podcasts. Meditation or journaling? Journaling. Mindset or skill set? Mindset. Planner or spontaneous? Spontaneous planner. <laughs> Gratitude or affirmations? Gratitude. Homebody or adventurer? Adventurer. Routine or spontaneity? Spontaneity. Goals or systems? Goals. Optimist or realist? Optimist. Realist. Realist. Growth or comfort? Three. Growth through comfort. Two. Music or silence? Silence. And right. we are done. done. 18. Oh. 18. <laughs> it's, it's tough, isn't it? That's the exit, mate. <laughs> yeah. exit. Sorry, say that again. Yeah. <laughs> oh, no, that was awesome. Um, yeah. Dion, it was a pleasure having you um, as our first guest on the podcast. Um, and it was really good to hear the, the, the insight of your coaching, your international international career, obviously, um, when you're out in the field as well. Um, and it's also good to hear your story and where you've come from and what you've done. I mean, I really enjoyed the the whole 95 in India, um, tough conditions, mentally um, getting through that. And, um, yeah. I'll, I'll, it's the moments, eh? Yeah, it's, it's, it's those moments. Proud which moments. Is, yeah, yeah which, is, which is cool. So it's been an absolute pleasure uh, for you to jump on the podcast today. Connor Phil, thanks for having me and all the best with the, the new venture. Cheers, man. Thank you. All right. Namahi, <laughs> Thank you. Cheers, bro. Cheers.